So sorry for uh, interrupting the, the beautiful soundtrack of uh, Amélie, but uh, this is not what we're here for. Um, thank you uh, for st sticking around. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Nikos Papakostas. Uh, I'm, I'm a co-founder of Interalia and um, I'm here just to introduce uh, the chair of uh, the uh, upcoming panel, uh, Mr. Manos Moskopoulos, uh, uh, who uh, is the uh, senior program officer at the Open Society Initiative in Europe, along with uh, Michelle Levoy, uh, Sasha Marsang, and Antigone Liberaki, they will be discussing uh, the era of COVID-19 in Europe, challenges and opportunities for social cohesion. Uh, Manos, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nikos, and of course, congratulations to you, Interalia, and your partners for putting together what has been so far a very interesting conference with a lot of very interesting and urgent uh, discussions. So, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me fine. Uh, as Nikos said, Red, we're here to discuss uh, challenges and opportunities in these testing times for social cohesion. And we've all seen over the past year that the pandemic has focused our attention on uh, a lot of a number of issues, but also the protection of public health and the protection of human lives at risk as an urgent uh, policy priority. And what role um, can regions, cities, local elected officials, people close to the ground uh, play in order to uh, help address uh, a number of issues that have come to the spotlight? Not necessarily new issues, very few of the problems that we've seen over the past year you would call new. But the pandemic has thrust them into the spotlight uh, in perhaps an unprecedented way in recent memory and perhaps offers an opportunity to discuss uh, how we move forward and make sure that everyone is protected, including migrants and other vulnerable groups that uh, unfortunately, predictably, uh, have uh, faced the most severe effects uh, from the pandemic and the uh, connected crises to it. So we have a great panel for you today, and I'm going to start with Sasa Masang, the Acting Secretary General of the European Public Health Alliance, uh, who's going to discuss uh, health policy and all of these issues from a European perspective, uh, offer us an intersectional lens as well when it comes to uh, the issues that we discuss. So Sasa, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Manos. I hope you can hear me and I hope you can see me. <laughs> Not just in dark shape. Um, so thank you for the invitation um, and for the opportunity to say a few things on behalf of the European Public Health Alliance. Um, who are we? Um, we are a pretty broad church uh, in terms of our membership, representing uh, disease specific organizations, healthcare professionals, representatives of vulnerable groups, some larger uh, platforms based in Brussels working on uh, cancer, diabetes, um, different chronic diseases communicable diseases, you name it, and then some small NGOs uh, based in the member states such as human rights, well, not that they're small, human rights 360 or praxis uh, in Greece, for example. And I think what makes us special in that sense is that kind of people-centric focus um, that we're bringing um, the public interest, uh, I guess, to um, these complex policy discussions about public health. Now, indeed, as we all know, and as I'm sure you've discussed yesterday, um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has brought out all these problems that health systems are uh, suffering from and for which we haven't really found ailments over many years, although uh, I got reminded yesterday when I listened in a little bit that obviously we've been talking about these things for decades, you know, like I mean, um, under the previous European Commission, for example, as an advocacy um, organization that mainly targets the European Commission, one of our goals was to work out uh, cross-border challenges, um, whether that is uh, antimicrobial resistance or access to medicines or NCD prevention more broadly. And obviously these challenges have existed for as long as I can think. Uh, and COVID-19 really has only exacerbated many of these things. And as we know, it's been a pandemic of inequalities. So like many others, um, the first thing I guess that IFA, in short for European Public Health Alliance, that IFA did 
was to sort of bring our membership together and take stock of the situation and work out the kind of broader stakeholder response. And, and PICOM, for example, Michelle is here. Um, they were also invited to a kind of stakeholder response meeting that we had with WHO Europe um, officers because WHO Europe was also, um, not just Europe, but WHO in general was putting together a kind of COVID-19 response team. What we were interested in was really to relay the experience, the lived experience, and some of the solutions maybe as well that representatives of vulnerable groups uh, within our membership and beyond had experienced. So we were looking at various groups there. First of all, um, homeless people and the situation um, that obviously physical distancing in shelters is really difficult to begin with. So you can't really practice physical distancing when you don't have a home, when you live on a mattress. Uh, food um, distribution was a problem for homeless people as well. Um, and, and just generally um, the, the request to, to really include housing as a social determinant of health in these discussions. We were looking at Roma communities. Um, Manus, you might be aware that IFA is working um, together with um, OSF Berlin on the um, Roma um, health uh, program. And obviously Roma communities, not only in Bulgaria, but also in many other countries, were subject to um, yeah, total lockdown, you might say, where entire neighborhoods were controlled by the police, where people were people who are already super marginalized because they don't have jobs, were not able to access services or um, little jobs here and there that they might gain their livelihoods from and things like that. Um, Anti-gypsyism on the rise because Roma communities and migrants by extension were um, blamed for spreading the virus, um, for not wanting to get vaccinated later on and things like this. Also thinking about EU migrants a little bit in this context, because obviously we had border closures from one day to the next, and a lot of these communities in particular um, depend on, on yeah, taking any opportunity that might come their way. We were also aware that Roma um, based in the United Kingdom, for example, were deported to countries in Eastern Europe um, really minor criminal offenses at times, and they were being held in detention facilities where we then had uh, COVID-19 outbreaks as well. Um, prisoners, um, you can imagine the same things apply to them because of overcrowding, multiple cell occupancy, poor sanitary conditions, poor access to soap, to disinfectants. And of course, many uh, of these communities are living with chronic decisions, uh, conditions with AIDS, HIV AIDS, drug addiction. So we already, these are intersectionalities, I think that apply to all of these communities. Um, it's not just one or the other, but really we have multiple factors coming together. We were looking at the gen gender impact of the pandemic, because obviously if you have single uh, mothers, um, in low pay jobs, well, clearly they, they are affected by school closures, by the fact that their jobs um, are not um, operational right now. Um, looking after kids um, as a single parent, as, as you all know, is, is, is an issue. We were looking at LGBTQI communities and the lack of the support networks um, that they so depend on, uh, community structures issues like domestic violence as well, applying again to many of these communities, um, but even parents can, can exercise domestic violence if, if you are um, gay, lesbian, trans, teenager, for example. Um, we were looking at sex workers, the response from sex workers not being included in um, decisions about um, not being able to work anymore in countries where these jobs were are part of, uh, yeah, considered to be um, regular forms of employment. Um, uh, in some cases, criminalization of sex work as well. And then finally, of course, also the impact on, on older people, not only um, people in care homes uh, being unable to see their family and friends, uh, but also generally um, the rise of ageism, uh, isolation, mental health problems across the board. So I think anything I'm talking about, we, we all know about, but vulnerable people are, or disadvantaged, marginalized groups are particularly affected by it. Um, I was struck here in Belgium, we have access to a lot of television from around Europe. So like Many of us have been binge watching a lot of Netflix, but I've also been watching um, a lot of news from around the world, obviously. So we have BBC, we have German television, French television, Dutch television, etc. So just on the BBC the other night, there was uh, a program 
about why is COVID-19 affecting uh, black communities uh, in particular in, in the UK, but by uh, extrapolation, I guess we could say also in other parts of Europe. And that brought me back to the idea, and I think the Lancet and others have commented on it, um, the, the, the sort of underlying syndemic of the pandemic, which really is that because people are already marginalized and living in deprived neighborhoods, not having well-paid jobs, um, living with chronic um, conditions because of pollution, because of overcrowding, because of deprivation, poverty, and so on. And to that, you might add racial discrimination as well. Um, obviously, um, they, their, their health is affected. And sometimes when I listen to these uh, discussions now, um, specifically on COVID, I wonder like, did we not know about all of this before? Did nobody ever read the Marmot Review, the, the findings that came out of the Marmot Review? Uh, uh, of WHO reports and many national reports. Um, you know, we, we've known the data for years. Did anybody really think that people in deprived neighborhoods um, have a longer life expectancy than others or the same quality of life? Well, obviously not. Um, but it's in that sense, it's good that COVID-19 has brought out these things. Um, what is good from a public health point of view for us is just that the attention is very firmly now on public health. We have a new European Commission um, that is much more involved in these issues. We have a new EU for Health program with a budget of, I think, 5.1 billion, which is significantly higher than the third previous health program. We don't yet know how this will translate into NGO funding and civil society funding, unfortunately. However, um, we do know that more of this funding will go to the national level, to the subnational level, probably as well. Um, so what do we do with that? Um, that, is, that is kind of um, one of the issues we're thinking about right now, particularly with regard to migration. I'm sure Michelle will say something about this as well. One of the worries or that I have personally, because I've been working on, on this topic in the past, is that I find there's a big clash between what we're saying on public health, and then we're looking at the European migration agenda, which is very much focused on returns and all that stuff. But I won't go too much into this, just that I find that migrants in particular are a group that are not so served, that are not served particularly well by European public health policies. There are many, many strategies coming our way. So the European Commission is working on a gender strategy, is working on a homelessness strategy. There's a disability uh, work um, just released yesterday. There is the European pillar of social rights um, action plan that was released yesterday as well. So it's all happening at the same time. In that sense, there are huge opportunities now for organizations like EFA. And, and your organizations taking an intersectional approach to really weave a story that makes sense, um, not only to yourselves, but also back to policymakers, because what we also need to call for are policy structures at the European level, at the national level, that really do connect to these issues and that really do take public health as a perspective um, to work from. Um, so those are the more general, um, I think, observations I had. I wanted to say just a few things also about the role of civil society. I think you had asked me about this as well. So I was listening um, yesterday um, a little bit to the debate and I heard the mayor of Palermo and then there was the deputy mayor of Utrecht. There was a lady from Bremen. I thought it was all very interesting to hear how their, um, how their opportunities at the subnational level, at the city level, you know, whether that's the cities of Safe Harbor um, and similar initiatives, um, where local authorities and businesses and civil society, but I think importantly, you know, also ordinary people must be involved in these structures, ideally, taking action and decisions together, whether that is to protect um, refugees from being deported, because obviously we do know that people have been deported to Afghanistan, to Nigeria, to, to um, all kinds of countries um, during the pandemic, which I also find extremely shocking. So it, it's, it's, it's good to see that these um, city level um, initiatives are there. Um, personally, I'm not well informed enough to know how effective they really are and whether that really does um, protect um, certain negative decisions from being taken at the national level. Because I also obviously between countries in Europe, we have many differences between the powers of regional and city level vis-a-vis -vis the, the national level. So that depends really on the country context. And as far as I'm aware, despite 
some very successful initiatives in Germany at the city level that doesn't prevent people from being deported at the same time. So unfortunately, um, again, we have a bit of a disconnect between these things. Um, and two final thoughts I wanted to give is that I was reflecting on my own experience uh, working with uh, migrants and with Roma and when I came to this topic and there's a good word in German I, I grew up in Germany but I lived in other countries afterwards but there's a good German word that came to mind and that word is called Berührungsangst it's called and what it means it's if you translate that into English literally fear of contact but actually it's a little bit fear of the other you might say it but the connotation is not quite as negative. I think Berührungsangst is that kind of natural uh, sort of inhibition that we feel when we are coming into contact with the other. Even if we want to help the other, we need to get to know the other first of all. And one of the things I find quite disconcerting right now under lockdown conditions where we're all masked and we're at home, we're not really in contact with anybody anymore, is that we are focusing a lot more again on the private sphere, on our personal problems, how are we going to cope with the crisis, how are we going to keep ourselves safe, and we're not really thinking so much anymore about those around us because we also we don't really see them anymore. So I think that kind of fear of contact, fear of the other is growing again, unfortunately, as we're idling away behind closed doors. And one of the things, going back to Belgian television, <laughs> I seem to get a lot of inspiration from television these days, there was a French philosopher on the French morning news the other day, and he wrote a book called La Rencontre. I think his name is Charles Pépin. I haven't read the book. I found it interesting because La Rencontre talks about what happens when we are ready to take off our masks again and when we are ready to face the other again. And what we can do now, he talked about what, what is it that we can do now actually to prepare for this encounter with um, the real world um, once um, we're in the post-pandemic world again. And I think that's really interesting because there are obviously things that we can do to digitally connect with people. We can, we can spark our curiosity. We can learn languages and all that stuff. We need to make sure that we don't become these um, people full of fear of contact because that's certainly um, a societal additional layer of the pandemic uh, that we need to deal with. And then of course, we need to face all the economic and social, the terrible stuff that we hear about every day, and particularly in countries like Greece or Spain, where unemployment was already so high, um, you know, because I think that's that's another thing Like many countries had never really recovered from the financial economic crisis. And now you're being faced with the COVID uh, pandemic on top of that. So I think I'll leave it here. I don't know if I answered your question at all necessarily, but hopefully I sparked up some ideas to, to discuss. Well, thank you, Sasa. The, of course, all of this was extremely interesting and useful, and, and, and some of the framing there, right? Like, especially when it comes to the day after, right? Uh, uh, really informs also how we treat uh, what's happening now as an opportunity, perhaps, right? To apply that intersectional approach that you, that you talked about and, and what steps we need to be taking in these very difficult uh, circumstances. But we'll get back to all of that later. Uh, next, we're going to Michelle Levoy, the director of the Platform for, Inter uh, for International Cooperation on Undocumented Migrants, PICUM. Uh, Michelle and PICUM being tireless advocates for the rights of undocumented migrants who, of course, have faced uh, severe threats and hardships uh, over the past year. So, Michelle, the floor is yours to walk us through all of these challenges and potentially the opportunities there. Thank you very much, Manos. Um, and thank you for the invitation to speak on this panel, which I have already found very interesting. Thanks to Sasha for really setting the scene. And what I'd like to really do is maybe compliment um, looking a little bit more at the migration policy framework, which also hopefully leads into what we'll hear from Antigone uh, and the experience on the Greek level um, and some of the fallout of probably what the migration policy framework at the EU is actually having on the national level. Um, so I'd like to kind of bear in mind these questions when we're looking at recovery from COVID. Um, are we including undocumented migrants in that recovery? Um, how can the budget uh, of the new the new EU budget help us or hinder that? Um, and how does this sit within the overall migration policy framework in the EU concerning undocumented migrants? So um, I wanted to look a little bit at the multi-annual funding framework that Sasha just referred to in his presentation, and then the EU's framing on a regular 
regular migration and then the migration pact also to look at that a little bit more in depth. So to start off with this new multi, the MFF as it's called, so it's the new budget for uh, 2021 to 2027 for the EU. Um, the EU, the new MFF does include some instruments, which I think as Sasha also mentioned, will be able to support um, services to people who are marginalized, who don't have access to mainstream social protection. And that includes potentially undocumented migrants. So we see, for example, the FIAD program currently, which is essentially giving um, help to the most severely deprived, such as food banks, the ERDF, the European Regional Development Fund, um, the European Social Fund, that's the ESF. So the extension of these programs in the next two years in the framework of the REACT EU um, instrument, which was approved, it, it can help support inclusion measures that can promote access, uh, better access to healthcare. And the upcoming European Social Forum, uh, excuse me, European Social Fund Plus um, will also be a fund to access services in a more generalized way. However, the scope of all these funds will be defined by member states' operational programs. And I think Sasha also referred to this when you were talking about the budgets. So it's important that as member states are currently developing these programs, that their actions to support healthcare and expanding access to all people living in the territories, including um, developing specific clinics, that's something that can be done on the European Regional Development uh, Fund, um, including expanding health services for people who don't have access to mainstream healthcare, such as undocumented, these could potentially be funded, but it really depends on how the national level programs will be will be developed. And here civil society can uh, and has in the past played a, a role where the governments allow it. So I, I think that this is something that we also have to be aware of. It's an it's an opportunity. Um, but sometimes the funding programs can seem very dense and difficult for civil society to to try to understand and to follow. Um, so it's it is something uh, to be definitely kind of paying attention to. Um, PICOM actually has worked in the past two years with ECRA, the European Council on Refugees and Exiles, on the funding framework, and we've developed a lot of resources around it. So if any of those can be useful to civil society and advocates and researchers, um, please um, feel free to look on our websites. So the second part then that I wanna look at is, okay, the funding might theoretically be possible, but how is this maybe overshadowed by how the EU sees undocumented migrants? How does the EU see irregular migration? And here I wanted to note that uh, 1999 was a key year because this was uh, the year that the EU adopted the common asylum and migration policy in the EU. So we've had this now for 21 years and this was at the Tamper Council Agreement. I think it's interesting when we talk about framing to also see the language that's used. So when we look at irregular migration in the early years, um, the language has evolved, I would say. The early years talked about combating illegal migration. And now we talk about um, preventing irregular migration. So thankfully in the official documents coming out of the European Commission, we have moved from illegal to irregular, which is really important. So we might have changed the framing, but the prioritization of the issue has only increased in the past 21 years. And this is largely due to the fact that amongst all of the current 27, there are member states who do not hold migration at all in any regard, uh, at least to say any high regard. And so the proposals coming out of the European Commission are always trying to find a balance. So this balance is always weighted down by those who are in a sense um, somewhat hostile to, to migrants on their territory. So uh, we've seen some of this increase then in prioritization of irregular migration and, and preventing it in recent years with devel development of Frontex. Um, so Frontex is the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, and it helped EU member states deport 50,000 people between 2007 and 2019. So over a 12 year period, 50,000 people, including to Afghanistan and Iraq, so other war torn countries. Now going forward from this year until 2024, 
So a three-year period, um, Frontex could organize the deportation of 50,000 people. So what they have managed in numbers over 12 years, they want to concentrate now in three years. So this is already one indication that it's going to be increased. To do that, the budget will be increased. In 2005, Frontex's budget was 6 million euros. In 2020, it's 460 million euros. Um, just so a couple more numbers. By 2027, Frontex should hire 10,000 operational EU staff with executive power in their own equipment. Um, and to do that, basically by uh, 2027, Frontex should have received 5.6 billion euros by European tax payers. So just to kind of say a return is a predominant um, focus of the EU's kind of addressing irregular migration. In addition to all of this around Frontex, there will also be a new return coordinator with the European Commission. This was proposed in the Migration Pact that was uh, re um, released in September. However, it should be noted there's not a, a similar role to resettle people. So there's not a resettlement coordinator proposal. Um, there would also be a new EU high level network for return and Frontex would get an additional deputy executive director on returns in particular. So I think this leads then to the migration pact. So this was released in September and it's, it's voluminous. Uh, you need a lot of time to go through all of the recommendations and the legislative proposals. I wanted to just highlight four points here, which I think are concerns for the human rights of undocumented migrants and how we also see this going forward um, in terms of recovery, et cetera, when we have some of these elements. So the first one is uh, detention. With the proposals of the pact, there will be more detention and it will be longer. Um, this we can see in the screening regulation. So this is when people arrive at borders and they have to do a pre-entry screening. Um, according to this, everyone who will cross the border irregularly or they're disembarked after being rescued at sea um, would be detained for up to five days, 10 days if, if it's a crisis situation. However, what's interesting is during that time, uh, there won't be uh, access to information or there will be very little of it. Uh, medical care will be very reduced um, and there won't be any judicial overview of the detention. Um, but what's also worrying about the screening regulation is that not only would it um, allow people to be apprehended before they theoretically arrive in the EU, but also people who are already in the EU and who are presumed to arrive irregularly could be arrested. So this means that people um, and communities of color who already are at risk of racial profiling by the police now may face further checks and further imprisonment of up to three days without judicial review, without access to a lawyer during this procedure. Um, it is quite hard to understand how any of this could be in line with the new EU action plan against racism. The EU anti-racism summit is coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, and the action plan actually aims to, discount, to counter discrimination by law enforcement authorities and to avoid profiling that re results in discrimination. So I think here we also see almost a complete contradiction in some sorts of two um, concurrent EU policies. And also detention would be in, in uh, the norm once the pre-screening, pre-entry screening has been completed. And then it moves to what is called the asylum and border uh, return procedures. What I wanted to highlight here is that in this longer procedure, so this is the phase where you kind of examine what the request is for um, entry into the EU. Um, this could take months and children um, who are between 12 to 18 who are with their families are not excluded from this procedure. So what's interesting is that children who are below the age of 12 or any child who is unaccompanied until the age of 18, those two groups are excluded. But children who are with their parents and who are between 12 and 18 um, are not excluded. So this means that children um, in that group could automatically be detained more. And what is interesting is that there are now international recommendations uh, it's saying that states should never detain children for immigration purposes. It's always against their best interests and it's always a child rights uh, violation. 
Um, so in a sense, what the EU is doing with the proposal is to go against everything that's been established in the past 10 years on an international level concerning immigration detention of children. And what EU member states have actually committed to who adopted the Global Compact on Migration three years ago, where it says states should actually work towards ending detention of children. So we recommend um, when we to try to get out of this framework that states look at alternatives to detention that are in the community that children and families should never be detained that safeguards like access to a lawyer and a right to appeal are upheld um, the second point on the pact is that the pact itself um, it focuses exclusively almost exclusively on returns but at the same time, it doesn't allow people to find other ways to regularize their status. Um, and also return isn't an option for everyone. Even the European Commission itself has estimated that each year 300,000 people cannot be returned. And this is, can be for many reasons, because of non refoulement questions, because of the right to private life, family life, because of children's rights, because they might be seriously ill, because they might be stateless, because of other practical obstacles. So, um, and also the European Migration Network has done a study that showed that um, more than half of EU member states provide temporary residence permits for medical reasons for people who are seriously ill. Um, PICOM itself, we've looked at five countries that have legislation uh, granting permits for undocumented victims of domestic violence. Um, there's at least eight countries that have regularization mechanisms for children, young people or families. So we have to look basically, all those things still need to be looked at. The, the default option cannot always be returned because legislation um, and policies in the EU member state level have actually proven that there are many other ways. Um, so we, we definitely recommend to separate the asylum and the return procedures. Um, and before re issuing a return order, there should be a clear moment when states could look at if alternative pathways uh, for case resolution could be accessible and if there could be human rights and EU jurisprudence that could come into play. Um, and I think it's also interesting to look at what is some of the evidence on the ground. I see that Jan Brat uh, was a speaker, I think, in some of the previous sessions. Um, and he has actually shown a program in the city of Utrecht uh, that supported undocumented people to solve their cases uh, that's been running since 2002. And some of the data coming out from that program are interesting. It's 91% uh, of the people who participated in that program were over um, 17 years have resolved their status. 59% um, were regularized and integrated into the local community and 19% were returned. But what's interesting with that data is that it shows that if you invest in trying to help people find a resolution for their case, uh, invest in legal aid, a lot of times you actually can find some kind of a resolution that's agreeable. And a lot of times that might be actually staying in the country. Uh, the third brief point is that with the pact, we think civil society might be even at a greater risk of harassment, criminalization and restricted access to border issues. In general, we see that there's an increased risk of shrinking space for civil society that tries to help migrants. This is, uh, punctuated periodically with individual organizations that are such as Kiza and Cyprus that are targeted uh, by authorities for their help in providing assistance to migrants. And Rizoma, a research project, found that 171 people were criminalized under the EU facilitation directive in the past five years. So we recommend that uh, member states at the border allow NGOs to access border facilities um, so that they can give legal aid, healthcare services, and also monitoring. And we should also um, send a message that humanitarian ac actions, uh, rescuing people uh, from drowning, giving food, et cetera, shouldn't be criminalized. And my last point that I wanted to end on is a little bit more positive. Um, so in the migration pact, uh, we would, um, feel that the issue of labor migration for European economies and societies is overshadowed by return. However, it is mentioned. Um, it's, it's actually discussed in the pact within the context of relations uh, with EU and partner countries. Um, however, most likely this will result in um, 
labor market opportunities um, or agreements that might be used as a reward with third countries to cooperate to prevent um, irregular migrants from entering into the EU. Um, within the pact, there's not really hardly any focus on labor exploitation and decent work. Um, hard, nothing really proposed to tackle labor exploitation. And this is a long-standing issue, like many of the ones Sasha referred to in your, your opening. These are long-standing issues that the Fundamental Rights Agency has um, researched on and reported on, and there's ev ample evidence of labor exploitation of migrant workers throughout the EU. So there are maybe just a couple of things that could be hopeful within the pact. Um, um, the pact propo proposes revising the EU single permit directive, which might be an opportunity to strengthen the rights and resident status of migrant workers and reduce labor exploitation. And it also says that it will develop other actions. Um, so one of the things that might be interesting is if the EU can develop a regulation for recruitment agencies. So the agencies that are recruiting migrant workers to come to the EU. It's currently a gap because the EU law only regulates equal treatment of temporary agency workers, but it doesn't regulate private employment agencies. So the EU could build on international guidance and good practice on this. Uh, recruitment uh, has also come up with policy documents from the parliament, from the council, European Economic and Social Committee. So I think there is, um, this is an area that we definitely have to look into um, and hopefully it can help over, it can help overshadow the focus on return in the coming years. But I think just as a final point, uh, we have to look at um, how recovery will really impact uh, the people who have in a sense suffered the most. Migrants have been amongst these groups. Undocumented within the broader population of migrants have um, doubly suffered because of irregular migration status. So it's, we, we had the solutions are especially in, in an integrated approach and an intersectional approach, as Sasha was referring to. Um, but we can't overlook that the migration policy framework overshadows any of these positive um, elements within the EU. So we have to also, in a sense, analyze all of the different opportunities and also um, try to really bring critical points to all of them. Thank you very much and definitely look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Michelle. And, uh... Yeah, first of all, to echo what you said, right, that it is unacceptable that we see humanitarians and humanitarian action being criminalized in uh, an ever-increasing uh, number of EU member states by now. And, and, and thanks for this uh, deep dive into the pact as well, right? And, and, and something that we could look at later on in the discussion is really how, what does that do for social cohesion as well? And has it learned anything from either the experience of the past year or the experience of the past five years, right, even when uh, larger numbers of people started arriving uh, to, to Greek islands and other places, fleeing war and persecution. But we'll get all, all, of, all of that later. Uh, before I turn to Adigone, I'd like to remind everyone that we have a Q&A open, so please start thinking and typing uh, your questions so we can dive right into them uh, after we've had a chance to hear from Adigone Liberaki, the General Manager of Solidarity Now, who is leading an incredible team of people that have been offering uh, frontline support uh, to uh, refugees, migrants, undocumented migrants, and uh, Roma people, other vulnerable groups in Greece. Only the floor is yours. Thank you, Manus, for the introduction, and thank you, Nikos, for the invitation, too. Um, when thinking about the um, ways to zoom into a small peripheral country of Europe, Greece, uh, I, I think it's interesting to start from uh, from a fact that has not been discussed very, um, very broadly. The fact that the COVID-19 pandemic is probably the first truly global event in the history of the human race. Uh, definitely, this is the point of view of Branko Milanovic, uh, who thinks that uh, it is global in the sense that it affects everybody regardless of uh, country of residence or social class, and that it creates a situation in which uh, when this is over, uh, hopefully, we shall all uh, have the same stories to share, uh, stories about fear, isolation, lost, uh, lost jobs and wages, lockdowns, government restrictions and face masks. And he suggests that no other event comes close to that, not even the 
very highly publicized athletic events. Now, when looking at this really truly global event from uh, the vantage point of Greece, I should uh, haste to say that this event coincides and overlaps with two other very serious shocks. The first, obviously, is the economic shock, the very long and deep economic recession we have been having for over 12 years now. But also, there's another shock that we have been going through, uh, shorter uh, in duration, and this is the, the, the refugee and migrant shock that started uh, basically seven years ago, six years ago, but it also bears an imprint of uh, the way we perceive things, the, the way we deal with things, and the way we understand ourselves within the broader society. So the coincidence of these three traumatic crises uh, brings to the fore a very well established, but very often overlooked truth that not everybody is equally exposed to the dangers be them health dangers or financial dangers or social uh, isolation dangers, and that vulnerable groups are at a much greater risk. Now, this in turn, in turn means that uh, social cohesion for what it was worth uh, before the current onslaught runs the risk of being further eroded. And the sense of belonging to the same boat trip uh, where everybody has a, an interest in reaching uh, the destination is fading away. So while the virus is very democratic uh, in nature, it, its consequences are very, very unequal and divisive. So what do we know about it? We know that social cohesion is at risk due to the pandemic. We also know that minorities and socially disadvantaged people are more vulnerable to COVID, those with no access to basic services, the poor. And we also know that collectively, as a society, we're as strong as the weakest link. Nevertheless, and in spite of the things that we know or that we have um, uh, revisited recently, but are old issues, in spite of this, uh, in contradistinction with this uh, set of common truths, when we are talking and campaigning about in favor of vulnerable people requesting international protection, we are basically seen as campaigning for luxury goods, as if there is a whole list of things that should be addressed first before getting to the bottom of the list. And I would say that tacit uh, counter-progressive values bridging on, um, uh, how shall I say, xenophobic, homophobic, uh, you name it, um, are resetting policy priorities in a manner that the most vulnerable, especially of foreign origin, find themselves at the bottom of the list. And this is true for policy making at the national level, but also, I'm afraid, at the subnational level. So, what we try to do as civil society actors uh, in such a, an environment is to try and uh, fill some of the gaps in basic information and basic services. At the same time, we have been trying to develop a more inclusive narrative on migrants and on refugees. In this respect, uh, Solidarity Now adjusted its communication strategy and action plan in order to respond to the health and social crisis. Our goal was to facilitate access to vital information uh, for those who were excluded from it. So we created a special new section in our website um, under the label dealing with COVID-19, where one could find uh, all the uploaded material about the pandemic. But most interesting, I think, we developed a number of tools for communicating and spreading information. Uh, the first innovative thing that we did is that we developed podcasts, um, 
together with the UNHCR and um, a private company called PodGR, we developed a series of 12 podcasts um, that uh, in order to ensure that uh, refugees and migrants who do not speak Greek have easy access to information about prevention and protection from COVID. This was developed in five, in five different languages. We also developed podcasts, a podcast training channel for children in camps. Uh, and this was created by our educational team uh, in the camps. Uh, with the aim of continuing the, to provide educational services to the children during the pandemic and uh, uh, providing the children with a new channel for communication. The third uh, uh, tool that we developed was in collaboration uh, with the UNHCR again, five radio spots um, in six different languages about uh, uh, the, the official government measures on COVID. Um, we also developed four short animated videos in six different languages, again with the UNHCR, presenting um, instructions for the proper use of masks and tips of how to avoid the spread of the virus. Uh, more importantly, we developed a psychological support to COVID victims um, service, uh, pro, pro bono psychological support um, uh, remotely to medical nursing and other staff uh, of, the, of the country's uh, hospitals, as well as fellow citizens who were in quarantine and were experiencing um, intense anxiety. Uh, we also developed videos, um, we translated various important papers, and we also co-signed an open letter um, reminding the EU authorities that uh, frontline front workers at the civil society organizations should be also included, not only in the protection and the vaccination, but also in the policy design regarding vulnerable people. Now, uh, the overlap, going back to the beginning, the overlap of three crises can be seen as a perfect storm, but it can also be seen as an opportunity to address both old and new inequalities and issues, both horizon horizontal and, and vertical in nature. The pandemic demonstrates the urgent need for a more inclusive, approach. Universal access to basic services must be at the center of any policy, while the situation of undocumented migrants must also be taken into account when designing policies. And also, it, I think it would be very useful to learn from initiatives such as uh, vaccine amnesty for undocumented people and other ways to include people who are always and by definition and intentionally excluded from any benefits. All in all, global events offer the opportunity for a better understanding of others and for deeper empathy. They also open a window of opportunity for more solidarity. We at Solidarity Now are determined not to miss it because we know that either we come out of it together or not at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adigoni. And uh, now we turn to uh, the discussion. And as I said, uh, everyone on this call can uh, uh, put their questions or comments in the chat and the Q&A and uh, I'll make sure the panel uh, reflects on them. Uh, before we turn to that, um, Everyone touched upon uh, one one issue that we've seen, which is, of course, how the pandemic has affected social cohesion, how it's affected the toxicity of some of the discussions that are happening, um, how different policies that are being proposed now, such as the pact, uh, impact, let's say, the social cohesion. So I'd like to to ask all of all of our speakers to uh, briefly comment on on, on that aspect. Um, over the past year. 
uh, this reaction to the pandemic at the national and subnational level. Um, as Adigoni mentioned, right, we've seen uh, policies that both are potentially harmed to cohesion. What can we learn from them and uh, what can policymakers learn from that? What can advocates learn from that so that uh, this next day, whenever it comes, whenever uh, we go back to any kind of normal, right, we don't risk uh, being in societies that where cohesion is severely threatened or even non-existent. Uh, so I'll start with Sasha, we'll go with the same order that we're in. Yeah, good question, Manos. Um, I think it's really quite important um, what Michelle said. Um, and just going back to this, that I find like the Migration Pact in particular is uh, totally at loggerheads with um, the public health, the more positive pu public health policies um, that are currently being implemented. Like I said before, like for IFA. We are relatively happy, of course, that there are some big new public health priorities out there, whether that is the cancer plan, the pharmaceutical strategy, which also addresses uh, access to medicine supplies, the farm to fork strategy, um, you know, which ultimately is about food systems as well, and the Green Deal um, targets that might improve uh, environmental conditions for people wherever they're living, you know, ultimately, if we if we adhere to these targets, um, and the migration pact, which in, indeed is so much focused on um, yeah, preventing, um, preventing migration. And, and, and also, I mean, the irony that people that have been deported are sometimes being brought back to their countries that, that they were in, because indeed, Maybe um, they were able to get better legal aid, or um, the people that they know they 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 put some kind of action that that worked. Uh, that maybe securing employment, these kinds of things. So people have been brought back from Afghanistan to Germany and other countries, um, which is costly. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of resources. I don't fully understand why everything needs to be so complicated. So I think what Michelle said, if there were some mechanisms uh, available at the a more local uh, level um, where um, really the interests of of local actors and not necessarily just individuals because of you know sometimes local administrations are also involved as we have heard yesterday in helping uh, migrant community migrants individual migrants to stay families to stay but somehow then this is being um, overridden by um, decisions being taken elsewhere and people are deported anyway. So I think if, if somehow we could bring some structures together where the real interests, the best interests of these people are really taken into account. Um, and, and then um, in combination um, with their social needs and the economic contribution that they could uh, make at, at, in their cities or wherever they are, that that would already be very helpful, but I don't really see that happening just yet. Um, the other thing, since we're talking about social cohesion, um, I hinted a little bit at the rise of stigma and discrimination, uh, particularly being attached to members of vulnerable groups because they are being perceived to be spreading the virus or making things even worse because they are living in these deprived conditions. Um, and um, since for some reason I'm thinking in German today, there's the other lovely word that Chancellor Merkel <laughs> brought to the table in 2015, which is Willkommenskultur. And that word, so a welcoming culture, and what that means um, at the more local level. And of course, that word, as quickly as it arrived, it seemed to dissipate as well, because as soon as some um, refugees or uh, asylum seekers were linked to some activities that were less wholesome uh, and the tabloids then um, exploited um, links with um, extremism and terrorism and this kind of thing. As quickly as the word arrived and people were excited about it, I, I felt like there was a real excitement, not only in Germany, also here in Belgium about civil society coming together, helping uh, refugees here in Brussels, we had a big network of people taking in and it's still in existence, but you know, people being excited about being able to um, have some kind of mechanism to, to house people, to help educate them, to help them uh, link them with um, the um, authorities. Um, but unfortunately, I think in a lot of places because of these um, negative connotations that came very quickly and well before COVID um, hit us, 
um, this has been eroded very quickly, as Antigone also said. So um, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm torn. I think there are lots of opportunities. Ultimately, I guess we're, we're sort of sailing uh, into a world where we're more aware of these issues, and it can only be a good thing. Let's also obviously be, um, again, extrapolating a little bit, the COVID pandemic also coincided with the Black Lives Matter movement, and I thought that was a very interesting development in Europe that finally questions of race, uh, maybe also questions of anti-gypsyism, et cetera, were sort of front and center and people who had not previously thought about them so much are now sort of engaged in that much more. So I think we're kind of going in the right direction, but um, policy coherence, I guess, is the issue. Policies are not always coherent. And if you don't have policy coherence, that's no good for social cohesion. Thank you, Sasha. Michelle, your thoughts? Yes, thank you. I think what we saw, in, if we just look at the perspective of um, undocumented migrants, we saw a lot of interesting developments in the first lockdown last year, I would say, uh, in the period from March until maybe May or June. Um, in March and April, there were probably five or six EU member states um, also including the UK at the time, so not EU member states, but uh, who were releasing migrants from detention. Um, kind of in a one sense addressing what Sasha had referred to, I think in your presentation about people who like who are just in prisons or in uh, jail-like settings and the risk of contamination. I mean, it was partially, I would say due to that, but especially because um, they couldn't actually carry out returns during those time periods because uh, in many countries, the flights were actually being curtailed or, or stopped. So um, it was kind of a combination, but it was interesting to see that some were releasing hundreds of people from detention. And then how they were, what happened after they were released was another story. So um, in some countries, this like Spain, um, the authorities had worked with a very large NGO who had already been placing people in um, accommodation and so it was kind of a less maybe it was a more seamless process of getting them into appropriate accommodation and other countries in Belgium for example civil society were saying that uh, they were detained they were released from detention to the streets so it was increasing homelessness and it wasn't done properly so there were um, problems in how that was done um, but in any case it was uh, a question of releasing them which was seen as rather positive um, however it was very short-lived um, because then they continued to be detained afterwards in that first lockdown period there were also a number of member states who extended the residence permits um, of people who would have had them expire during the lockdown so um, because they couldn't do their administrative procedures. Um, there were also member states who were not carrying out any returns um, in some of those periods. Um, and Portugal offered a specific program uh, for regularization. And, and I think that's what's also really interesting is that um, regularization of people who have a regular status um, has been usually tried to be avoided at the EU level. Um, and the EU will always say it's because it does not have competence, but it's, and it does not. I mean, the majority of the regularizations happen at the national level. Although there is some EU legislation that does allow for some regularization of people, but the majority is at the national level. Um, but it, it kind of brought it back on the agenda. Italy also had a regularization of agricultural workers um, during, that happened during the lockdown period. So I think what's interesting is that you can see some of these policies on the national level that have um, gained a little bit more resurgence and a little bit more visibility. And that's very important, I think, at the EU level. But also at the EU level, uh, there were also some other, uh, these last year and this year, they're all the strategy years because it, it's been a new commission overall for the past almost two years now. And so the EU then has to then release all these strategies for a five-year period. So last year in June, the victims of crime strategy came out. Um, Sasha had also mentioned a rise in domestic violence overall. Um, we've seen this with undocumented migrants that one of the reasons why they don't report if they are victims of domestic violence or other violence um, is because they fear that by going to the police, they will be deported. Um, and so the victims of crime strategy, when it came out last year, it specifically referenced undocumented migrants, saying that they're particularly vulnerable. This was a huge step forward. Um, there's a new victims of crime 
strategy, uh, excuse me, uh, platform that the EU is managing and undocumented are clearly visible in the efforts of DG Justice to try to remedy this situation. Um, and there's also from last year in November, the EU integration strategy that came out and it no longer refers to the strategy as specifically applying to people who are legally residing in the EU. So they've dropped that reference to keep it a bit more open. This also is a good step forward. Um, so I think that there are other areas on the, there are other policy areas in the EU that we have to look at. Um, and we as PICOM look at them at the, and other actors look at them at the EU level, but in a sense, they're, they're quite similar on the national level. Um, a lot of the promise is actually not in the area of migration policy, it's in the other areas. But as Sasha was saying, it has to be a coherent approach. Um, any good efforts by the victims of crime strategy shouldn't be outdone by the migration pact, for example, just as a concrete one. Um, and the last point I wanted to make is, um, I think also what is really um, something that's ongoing and developing is the whole rollout of the vaccine for COVID um, on the national level and across the EU. Uh, we're actually doing some research within PECOM to see which countries in the EU explicitly include undocumented in their national level strategies. Uh, so really that they have it in writing. Uh, we've noted it almost up to 10 um so far uh, we're actually doing a lot of this sharing on our twitter account um so you can find some more information there and then there are other countries beyond nearly almost 10 who are kind of implicitly including them um but i think the key the key question even with the ones who are explicit about it who basically have a common sense uh, public health approach basically when you're explicit about including a, a specifically vulnerable group um the other ones who, even them, you, we have to ensure that the personal data of undocumented migrants won't be transmitted to the immigration authorities. So civil society has really insisted that we have things in writing in those countries so that it won't be misused. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that for, for this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Niela. The last point you made, it's super important to make sure that everyone knows they're safe uh, from immigration enforcement when they uh, reach out to get tested or get a vaccine or, or, or any of the, the things that now are being put forward as front and center as the absolutely essential things that uh, everyone needs to do. But uh, but also it's much broader and again something that didn't um, arise as a result of the pandemic but something that has been there and the pandemic has allowed to shine some light into. Uh, moving on to Adigoni on the same question of uh, what have we learned on social cohesion and what can we do? I would like to respond to your uh, initial formulation of the question regarding the toxic reactions that seem to get out of uh, all the most important events. And I, I, uh, taking a, um, um, the, the perspective uh, of an organization working on the ground, I have to say that it seems to me that all really shaking and important events sort of uh, unleash um, some very obscure attitudes and values as a first reaction. It's like an important event is taking off the lid of a, of a pan that you sort of cook all the um, deepest uh, beliefs regarding uh, values, uh, others, and so on, identities, and so on. So it's not, a, it's not strange that the pandemic brings to the fore fears and um, uh, judgments and discrimination. Uh, it's not strange that the beginning of the, of the, of the Me Too movement in Greece brought to the fore uh, uh, narratives very similar to the QAnon in the US and uh, sort of, it is, it, it, this happens, it comes with an with a, with a, with a important event. Now, what we can learn from it and do about it is that we need to develop a more uh, holistic, positive narrative that um, uh, defends the interests of the vulnerable people, a narrative capable of uh, capturing the minds and hearts of the ordinary people. It's not like um, talking at the high 
policy level, because what we hear, at least in political discussions in, in, in my part of the world, is that politicians are only following the pressure, the populist and the reactionary pressure from the ground. So our job is to interfere on the ground by counter um, by countering all these toxic narratives, because there are a lot of arguments in place that can form a positive narrative. And this, I think, is our uh, challenging job, and we are ready to do it. And we tend to see this uh, unleashing of toxicity as the first stage of an experiment, which we have very good uh, um, chances of uh, having some good uh, results in the end. Thank you, Andrew. And that's a that's a great example of the of the toxicity. And and the other thing that I, that I was thinking about was also uh, looking at the pact and 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 the measures that Michelle proposed, and also what you just said about like the reality on the ground in Greece. Uh, thinking of the Greek islands, thinking of the places where the pact had actually uh, been uh, tested, right, as a, as a kind of laboratory of migration policy and uh, the disastrous impacts on social cohesion there, where you see, um, you know, this uh, this excitement uh, that that Sasa talked about, where you saw that also on the ground in, in, in the front lines, right, in the places where uh, this pact and visitors at uh, detention facilities, like Ms. Ho said. Um, you saw that excitement there like five, six years ago, right? That has also uh, been replaced by frustration. And it's also those parts, uh, a bit in the periphery, a bit far from the center, where I think some of the dangers to social cohesion, as we emerge from this pandemic, are going to be um, even more pronounced. Um, moving to another topic that, uh, that was mentioned, uh, I think all of you have touched upon it, uh, to varying degrees had to do with uh, looking at the unique impacts that, uh, that some of these vulnerable groups uh, faced, such as labor exploitation, such as um, the lack of access to healthcare, and, and, and so on. And, and, and this panel, this, uh, the conception of this panel starts from the hypothesis that decentralizing some of these decisions uh, could provide uh, the key. Uh, it could provide the the answer uh, that we're looking for. So I'd like you know to, to zoom in a bit on that, on, on the importance of decentralization here, on the importance of 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 some of these decisions happening at a more local uh, level. And I'll reverse the order. We can start with Ariwan and then go to Michelle and Sasa for this uh, particular one, going from the ground and then uh, to thematic, let's say, and to the uh, European. Uh, what opportunities do you see for this happening, either in the Greek context of Begonia or in the context of undocumented migrants, uh, or at the European level, moving forward? Maybe uh, Greece is not the best example to draw lessons regarding the potential of subnational uh, policies and interventions, because we have a very, um, how shall I say, uh, contradictory framework. We have a very um, strong tradition of central state decisions at the policy level. We have, in, uh, in theory, some devolution of power in local authorities without the budget to support it. So in a sense, uh, we're still uh, at a very infantile stage of uh, the decentralization model and how it could work. But definitely, I, because I think that uh, our work cannot uh, proceed and cannot uh, uh, conclude successfully without the support and the trust of uh, the social environment within which our um, vulnerable people find themselves, i.e., uh, towns, um, you know, small, smaller or larger urban areas. Definitely, we need the cooperation and the alignment of some priorities, at least with uh, with uh, um, with local authorities. But I don't think that we are. I can draw 
very meaningful examples from what we have um, tried and um, failed so far. Thank you, Arigone. Michelle. Yes, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think we've seen within, so the looking at the situation of undocumented migrants, um, there's been an interesting initiative uh, that's, um, I think some of the cities who have been speaking on your panel, Utrecht in particular, have participated in, um, called the City Initiative on Irregular Migrants, which is coordinated by Oxford uh, Compass. Um, and which involves, I think, now more than 20 cities uh, throughout uh, the EU, uh, also including Switzerland, um, that uh, look at basically how do they as city level actors deal with the presence of undocumented within their jurisdictions? What are some of the challenges that they face? Uh, what are some of the ways that they go about these challenges at the local level? Um, what could be useful within their context that another city might be able to replicate? Um, what has been useful in their council decisions um, and, you know, and how the city leads the discussion within the councils? So this whole um, project, um, which is now in its second phase, um, produced guidance, I think about two years ago, um, where it looked at good practices um, of a lot of these cities um, throughout Europe and highlighted it in the guidance. It's been largely disseminated also by the Council of Europe bodies looking at lo local authorities. Um, and, and the project continues. And I think what's really interesting is that, um, yeah, cities learn from each other. Um, and, and there's a lot of expertise that uh, is potentially able to be shared and exchanged uh, when you can bring city level actors together. Um, and, and also you can give visibility of the issue by having really authoritative um, publications like that, like guidance, which actually highlight a lot of these practices. Um, so I think it's, it's been a really interesting project. Um, all of it's available online. Um, and, and it also shows, I mean, some of the practices show that uh, because local level actors have to deal with the reality of social inclusion of undocumented migrants, they can come up with solutions that sometimes can encourage the national level um, to reorientate policy lines or funding. And I think one of the examples could be from the Netherlands, uh, where we saw, I think, uh, five key cities from the Netherlands that um, developed a project with uh, the national level government um, that was a couple million euros over a three year period, I believe, um, to, to give funding to cities who were working on re return orientation. So basically what we were talking about earlier in terms of helping people find different possibilities potentially for regularization or for in the end return, but really helping with case management, uh, also helping them to have local integration while they were doing that. Um, and so this was something that the cities actually developed and the national level supported it. Um, and, and it's an interesting example because at the same time, a lot of the policies that directly impact undocumented are developed at the national level or are developed at the EU and then transposed at the national level. So it's kind of a question for cities, how can we also act? Um, and sometimes the uh, it's, it's also through their own uh, support to uh, civil society organizations that work with undocumented. Um, sometimes they are also able to provide funding or, or support directly to undocumented at the city level. So um, I think that there are definitely a lot of uh, emerging examples uh, within the European context that have to be disseminated more and also replicated and also transmitted more to the EU level uh, because they are definitely key actors. Thank you very much, Sasha. Yeah, now I'm on. Um, yeah, I think both both were good reflections. I totally agree with Michelle um, that if um, city, I was also doing a bit of research on city level um, initiatives in particular. So that's why I listened in yesterday and and indeed uh, the kind of safe harbor cities I mentioned earlier in, in Germany, the, um, the Euro cities integrating cities charter that a lot of cities have signed and what Michelle just mentioned now 
Obviously, the, these are very uh, important initiatives as long as they have traction. And I think what Michelle also said, I, I totally agree with that the national level needs to endorse that and, and be on the same page, um, because otherwise you have the clash of competencies and you have well-intended cities. And let's face it, what city these days, I don't actually know any big city that doesn't want to be um, diverse and inclusive on the surface of things. So I think we have to be a little bit careful that they don't become marketing ploys for cities, because ultimately all of us, we want our Vietnamese food, we want our African cultural things, we want, you know, like we are, we are, multi, you know, we live in a multicultural global world, um, and it becomes an easy thing to market your city as um, diverse, but there needs to also be substance to it. That's, that's just a little side comment here. Um, the last time I was in Athens was in December 2018, and it was to um, look at the use of um, the AMIF funds, the asylum migration uh, funding uh, for um, mental health um, projects um, targeting um, migrants who had um, arrived um, as part of the migrant influx 2000, from 2015 onwards. Uh, and one of the issues indeed, and this is going back to now what Antigone said a little bit, um, even when you have, again, well-intentioned projects that um, are passionately being undertaken by local actors, such as uh, members of IFA or PICOM or whoever, um, do we have a structure then in the national um, system to um, accommodate the results or to, to prolong these projects um, within the, the national or the, the city structure. And that didn't seem to be the case. So these projects, they ended and the money was spent and that was the end of the story. Um, and the final reflection I had was in the Roma context, these, um, Manos, you might be aware of these, uh, I think it's called community-led local development um, funding coming from the EU um, through, I think the, um, European Structural and Investment Funds, I think it is, or maybe it's the, also linked with, with regional funding or something. And this is really meant to empower uh, Roma communities um, themselves to, begin, to become part of um, the process, the decision-making process and the policy process to improve their communities. But, and I'm sure there have been some successful examples there. I saw, the reason it came to mind is because I saw a report about this by the European Roma Grassroots Organization, Ergo, um, that was, I think, came out this week. And, um, but nonetheless, we know that the, the overall um, situation of Roma communities in, in um, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, et cetera, it hasn't really improved. Um, over the last decade, despite the Roma decade. So it's, I don't know, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's great if these things um, have buy-in from the national level and from civil society and, and the right people are involved and we don't um, have um, clientelism or corruption and these kinds of issues in the way. <laughs> Very good points. Uh, thank you, Sasha. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we do have a, 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 com a, a comment and a question from the uh, from the audience as well. Um, uh, reflecting on the fact that this toxicity uh, starts with migration management policy, right? As uh, as you've all mentioned, uh, but it unavoidably spreads to other population groups and pushes uh, governments sometimes towards uh, more authoritarian practices. Um, Question there being, is it useful to challenge them uh, as an example of self-harm or uh, as the Manic Street preachers put it, if you tolerate this, then your children will be next, I would add, right? Um, and then uh, another point coming from the audience there is that whether um, the hotspot approach to the European agenda on migration was basically an attempt to enact degradation by design in frontline states as opposed to perhaps a policy gap. Um, given that we're coming towards the, the end, also having in mind uh, those thoughts coming, uh, coming from the audience, I'd like everyone to, uh, for a minute or two maximum, uh, to, to offer some last sentences for, for this panel. Uh, I'll start with Tadigoni. Okay. Um, well, uh, there is a lot to say about um, how 
policies are designed, but uh, the idea of a, of a conspiracy being behind bad policies uh, intentionally de uh, uh, degrading reception conditions in order to uh, put the blame in frontline states, I think this is not uh, among the variety of, uh, of uh, monsters that we have to uh, confront. I think there is definitely a, a, a tacit um, uh, agreement that the, the tougher the conditions, the more discouraged people are going to be when thinking of moving into Europe. This, I, I think, is undoubt, undoubtedly so. But I don't think that there was this uh, calculation of, um, you know, uh, somehow uh, putting all the blame on front on frontline states. Although, by by history and geography, they were the the the, the ones who got the the main um, uh, the main shock of the of the of the entrance. So there is a lot to be. Uh, to criticize policymakers at all levels. Uh, for me, it's um, more important to try and win the argument on the ground because they always use the ordinary people who is supposedly xenophobic, racist, and sexist in order to cover for reactionary policy. So if we win the, the, the audience, if we win the society, uh, there, there, I will take away all the wrong arguments from them. That's my reaction. Thank you, Antigone. Michelle. Very wise words, Antigone. Um, uh, I have to follow you. So um, I would just say from Peacom's point of view, um, this year we actually have existed, we will have existed for 20 years. And I think, and I say that because I think it's interesting to see when you, you know, you've, carried out this work over two decades, um, how certain themes are also marked in terms of overall picture, narrative and framing. And I wanted to just give one example and that's detention of children. Um, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and the Migrant Workers Committee held a joint general day of uh, reflection on migrant children in 2012, so about 10 years ago. And in that report, that was kind of the first time I would say that you had like a general pronouncing from two UN agencies that children shouldn't be detained for immigration purposes. I think in the lead up to that, you had maybe some special procedures, uh, you know, some of the other mechanisms at the UN level who were weighing in. But that was really a definitive moment. Um, and then I think like in the, the years then after you had a number of other UN entities coming on board. But until that time period, you didn't really have any recommendation on it. So basically children have, you know, the EU framework now allows children to be detained. Uh, the, um, the returns directive um, has allowed it and the proposed returns directive might not allow it, but that's, questionable if that would be approved. And I think the research from medical professionals has, you know, just from the medical professionals alone, it says that it doesn't matter if you're a child and you're detained for one hour or 365 days, you're going to have an impact on your psychosocial health. Um, and you have all these problems that appear, um, you know, uh, just really detrimental impacts on children. So I think probably any bystander to this debate would understand that you probably shouldn't put any child in a cage. Um, what will happen to that cage? But yet it seemed, I think the whole way that it took such a long time to have all of these pronunciations by UN bodies, by the Council of Europe, um, it, it wasn't a given that children shouldn't be detained for immigration purposes. It had to emerge. And once it's emerged, now it is a given. But even so, it's basically, we have to realize that so many things are ingrained in um, psyche of individuals and institutions that develop these policies. And to challenge them, it takes a lot of time and concerted effort and energy uh, by all of us, whether it's at the local, coordination level, whether it's at the national, regional, global, et cetera. None of it's possible without um, years actually of work um, because these problems are huge. Um, 
and and so I think that's what I would also just give as a takeaway is that um, we have to be concerted and we have to unpack them and see which segments we can actually unpack in a very focused way um, because maybe unpacking all of that might lift up the issues that we're working on but even unpacking just part of it uh, it's still a challenge and I find it particularly disturbing that the migration pact actually proposes more detention of children when we have this global recognition maybe when we didn't have it at the early 2000s that was another situation but now there's actually there is kind of no excuse. It's all there now. Um, so that's how I'll, I'll leave that last thought. Thank you, Ms. Owen. We'll come to the end of this panel with Sasa. Sasa, very briefly, uh, your action to this. Yeah, very briefly. Going back to what Antigone said, I think. Um, I think we also have an, a problem of education in Europe still. I think what I said earlier about the, the fear of the contact, the fear of the other and all that stuff, to me it goes back to the fact that um, maybe particularly in more newly multicultural societies in Europe or whatever, we don't really have um, a real encounter with difference so much. Um, and from an early age, I think there's a lot of stuff that can be done. We can link public health objectives. We can discuss migration and the other uh, as part of the yeah, education through the life course. Um, and I think um, if as long as we haven't achieved that and people are coming out of school, knowing a little bit more about the conditions that make people migrate in the first place uh, and all of that, we're not going to really have a society that is truly open, even if some cities might be storming ahead. So, and also again, the toxicity, the, the fact that people are selectively receiving news via social media now doesn't really help the fact if you have the former president of the US tweeting out whatever, and people will only hear that and they will not look at the other side. So we have a very, very split population, but I think, again, we have to be also positive and we have to assume that people aren't really negative and racist by nature, but it's just the information that they're getting. And I shut up. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I see Nikos, which definitely means we have come to the end of the panel. That's uh, right. Sorry, sorry for no. bullying you with uh, in that. <laughs> sorry, Sasha. Um, we need to, to move on to, to the next panel. Uh, I'd like to, to take this chance to, from my side to, to thank uh, very much uh, Michelle, uh, Sasha and Andigoni and of course you Manos for the very useful insights. Uh, Manos, uh, the floor is yours to, to wrap up and just before I go, uh, we are welcoming in the, in the next panel uh, that is organized by uh, Human Rights 360, Dr. Nancy Papathanasiou from Orlando LGBT+, Tassos Metopoulos uh, from STEPS, uh, Katerina Purnara from, from Human Rights 360, and Maya Lovberg, uh, Lovberg Hansen from Danish Street Lawyers Copenhagen, and uh, facilitator uh, Eleni Taku. Uh, we will start uh, at two minutes, let's say, past two, uh, past... Uh, 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 with 132, let's say something like this. Cool, thank you, Nikos. And I want to thank uh, Michelle, Sasa, and Adivoni for uh, giving us a lot to think about as we come to hopefully, right, come to the end of this uh, this pandemic, this very interesting period of, of our lives. But as, as someone said, right, I, I think it was Adivoni, like this first truly global. Uh, uh, truly global experience, but at the same time, an experience that very much affected people along uh, dividing lines that uh, pre-existed and, and were there. And as we prepare for whatever this new normal is going to look like, uh, what I'll take away from this conversation is obviously that uh, we really need uh, new coordinated policy that actually takes into account uh, the needs, incentives, and uh, lived realities of, of people that find themselves, unfortunately, all too often at the margins of society, especially if someone thinks also what they have done to keep our societies running while most of us were hiding in a home. So thank you all for, for, for this uh, discussion, and uh, I hope that we've given enough to the audience uh, to think about as we approach uh, the next few months. So good luck to Nikos, Interalia and the team for the rest of the uh, conference. And uh, yeah, once again, thank you for putting this together and contributing to this very important set of discussions. So goodbye. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Uh, let's start in uh, one thirty-two and uh, and and enjoy a little bit of uh, the Amelie soundtrack for uh, the following couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. 